So Henrik and I are going to talk about the recent developments in Abinit related to the computation of the intrinsic mobility of electrons and holes in semiconductors. So I will first start by introdu introducing the concept, the basic principles behind our implementation and all the tricks that we have implemented in order to make this computation actually feasible. And then Henrik will go uh, deeper into the details of the implementation, uh, the input variables, the flow of the computation and so on. So as you may know, the electron phonon coupling uh, plays an important role in various phenomena like the, the phonon mediated superconductivity, the indirect light absorption or the intrinsic mobility, which is limited by the scattering of electrons by phonons in the material. And this scattering mechanism is actually dominating at high temperature or when the impurity concentration is uh, very low, like you, like you can see here in the case of silicon. So in order to compute this mobility, we can use the, the Boltzmann transport formalism in the relaxation time approximation. We have this formula for the mobility of electrons. So you see that we have a sum over the, the states in the conduction bands, and we have to integrate over the Brillouin zone the electron velocities, the electron lifetimes, and the derivative of the Fermi Dirac occupation function. So these lifetimes uh, have to account for the different scattering mechanisms occurring in the material. So the scattering by defects, the scattering by grain boundaries, and so on. But in the case of the phonon limited mobility, we just focus on the scattering by phonons. And so we have this formula for, for an electron in a state nk. These electrons can emit or absorb a phonon of wave vector q and go in the state mk plus q. Uh, so we have to sum over the possible final states and we have to integrate over the, all the possible phonon wave vectors. We have here the electron phonon coupling matrix elements, g's. And we also have to take into account the energy conservation for the absorption here and the emission here of a phonon. There are different softwares available to compute these lifetimes. The main one for now is probably EPW. And EPW uses one year functions to interpolate these matrix elements because this integration converges slow slowly with the number of Q points. And you don't want to compute all the matrix elements using the FPT. So instead, what EPW does is use one year functions to interpolate these matrix elements on very dense Q points grid and finally reach uh, a converged value for the lifetimes. There's also Perturbo that uses atomic orbitals instead of one functions to, to perform the interpolation, but this is not uh, openly available. And so we have decided to have our own implementation in Abinit using plane waves. So we don't need any more one functions or atomic orbitals to compute the lifetimes. So this is just to try to convince you that the implementation in Abinit is working. So in this slide, I compare the, the line width, which is just one over the lifetime in silicon, in the, in the valence band and in the conduction band, computed with Abinit and with EPW. And basically, in the, in the valence band, you see that the agreement between EPW and Abinit is very good. It's not the case anymore in the conduction band. And that's because with EPW, I one yearized only uh, for the one yearization, I included only the valence band inside the frozen window. And in the conduction band, it's not the case. So in the conduction band, the energies before and after the one yearization, the, the energies of the electrons, can change. And that leads to these uh, discrepancies be, uh, of the line width between the two codes. So now let's zoom uh, close to the conduction band uh, minimum of silicon in an energy region of 90 milli electron volt. And you see that very close to the conduction band minimum, the line width are very small. So the lifetimes are very large. And this is because the electrons don't have a lot of possibilities to emit phonons. Okay? And below a certain energy, given by the, the, the optical phonon energy, uh, actually the, the electrons cannot emit optical phonons because there wouldn't be any states to scatter to. They would have to go in the forbidden band, so that's impossible. And above this energy, then electrons can begin to emit optical phonons as well, so there are more scattering channels. So the line width increases because the lifetimes decrease. So as I said, in order to compute the line width, we have these uh, delta functions for the energy conservation that we have to integrate. And usually what is done with these delta functions is to replace them by either Gaussian or Lorentzian peaks that have a small width that we call the broadening parameter. And you see that depending on the, the broadening parameter, we have a different line width. Basically, the larger the broadening parameter, the larger the line width. So what we have to do is to perform a, cover, a, a convergence study on the broadening parameter, so we have to decrease the broadening parameter so that the delta begins to look more and more like an actual uh, 
delta, direct delta, up to the point where the line width will not change anymore. In order to avoid this uh, convergence study, we have implemented the tetra joint integration method so that we can integrate this delta directly without having to introduce a broadening parameter. This allows us to directly, so this is the result in blue here, this allows us to directly have the correct behavior. And you see that, uh, well, the, the blue results is basically the, the, the result that would correspond to a zero broadening with a Laurentian uh, peak. And we don't have to perform this conversion study anymore. So this is uh, a big gain in time. So now, uh, as I said also, in order to compute the line width, we have to integrate over the Forman wave vectors. So to, so to do that, we have uh, a Q-point grid. And we increase the Q-point grid up to the point where we have included enough Forman wave vectors and the line width are converged. So this is the error on the line width as a function of this grid computed with the tetrahedron and with the Laurentian uh, techniques. And you see that the tetrahedron is converging way faster than the Laurentian case. The Laurentian is not even converged yet. And this is similar to the case of a density of states for which we know that we need less k points to converge the density of states than uh, when we use a Gaussian broadening. Uh, but you see that we still need 50, 50, 50, 60, 60, 60 q point grids. So this is still uh, quite dense. And this is because we have this, so in this, the, the formula for the lifetimes, we have this delta in red here, and these are varying rapidly in the, in the Brewer zone. So because of these terms, we have to compute the matrix elements on a very dense coupon grid, on a 50, 50, 50 coupon grid. And this is quite heavy because the computation of the matrix element is the heavy task in this formula. The computation of these delta is actually quite simple because it's only energies uh, electron energies and phonon energy, so this is quite cheap to compute. So instead we have, uh, in order to, 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 to counter this problem, we have implemented the double grid technique where we have one grid for the matrix element and one grid that should be denser for the, the energies. So for example here we would compute the matrix element on the, the green dots and then uh, we would use a denser grid, so the black dots for the, this factor here. So for example in this green region for all of the red dots, we would compute these energies and these delta factors, and we would consider the matrix elements to be constant and equal to the value of the, of the matrix elements on the coarse grid. How does that help? Well, let's look at silicon again. For example, the blue curve here, the nine by nine by nine, we use, for example, for this dot, it's a nine by nine by nine coupon grid for the matrix element and the same one for the energies, but then we densify the grid for the energies. So here, we have a 9 by 9 by 9 grid for the matrix element, but an 18, 18, 18 grid for the energies. And just by densifying the grid for the energies, so not for the matrix elements, we, re we, we can really reduce the error down. And using, for example, an 18 by 18 by 18 grid for the matrix elements and increasing the density for the energies, we can really have a, a result that is quite similar to the one that where we use a full 19, 19, 90 grid for the matrix elements and for the energies. Uh, now what happens in polar semiconductors? Well, in this type of material, you know that the matrix elements uh, diverge close to gamma. This divergence is problematic because we have to integrate that. It is integrable, but that just means that we need to include a lot of Q points because we need to be able to capture this divergence correctly. So this is the case of gallium phosphide, which is a polar material. And you see that the error is decreasing, but slower than in the case of silicon. Silicon 50, 50, 50 was enough. In this case, we need way more Q points. And this is just because of the divergence of the, the, the matrix elements. The tetrahedron is still converging faster than the, the Rowan-Chan technique because the deltas are better described, but the matrix elements are still diverging and the tetrahedron is not helping for that. We can use the double grid technique for polar materials. But, uh, so the double grid technique is just helping for the energies, not for the matrix elements. So you see that 888, we are decreasing a little bit the error, but you are still around 10 milli electron volt for the average error, which is a lot. And that is just because uh, increasing the density for the energies is helping, but we still have a coarse grid for the matrix elements. So the divergence is still not correctly captured. And for the 48, 48, 48, you see that densifying the grid for the energies does not even change the result. So what we can do to, to counter that is to tune a bit the double grid technique and separate these matrix elements into long range and short range parts. Uh, 
the long range is the one that is diverging and it's analytical so that means that we can compute it quite easily and so what you can do is actually co in this region consider now only the short range part of the matrix element to be constant but compute the long range part on all of the, the points belonging to the dense grid. So now we have the long range part that is diverging on the dense grid so we are able to capture better this divergence of the matrix elements. So this was the result for the W technique without this special treatment for the, the matrix element. Now what happens if we use this special treatment? Well, you see that the error is decreasing by almost a factor of two. So it's helping and uh, the computational cost is, uh, is basically, basically the same. And you see that now, starting from the 48, 48, 48, densifying, before it was not helping, now it's decreasing the error because we are capturing better the, the long range part of the matrix elements. Okay, so now that we have a good confidence about the lifetimes that we can get with Abinit, we can actually use them to compute the mobility. So let's look at silicon. So this is the band structure of silicon. We can zoom in the gamma X segment where we have the conduction band minimum. And in order to solve this integral, what we would do usually is to use a homogeneous sampling like this. So we would compute the velocities and the lifetimes on all of these states that are uh, sampled by the homogeneous grid. But we have this uh, derivative of the Fermi Dirac in the, in the integration, in the, in the integrant. And this is basically non-zero only on a small region here. So when we do the homogeneous sampling and compute everything, then there's a lot of stuff that is actually useless. So what we should do is only consider the states that are in the region where this is practically non-zero. So these are the only case states that we need to sample and I will show you later what it gives in, in numbers. So that was for the K point. Now what about the Q points? Well, for the Q points, we have the energy and the momentum conservation. And that's actually also reducing a lot the number of Q points that we have to include to compute the, the, the lifetimes. Because let's say we have an electron in this pocket then we have to consider Q points only for the, the transition that will keep the electrons in this pocket, so small Q, Q vectors, and also uh, transitions that will go from this pocket to another pocket, so Q vectors that are quite long. And we don't have to, to actually con uh, consider the, the Q vectors in between. So we have this new implementation in Abinit, uh, where we automatically select the important K points for the, the, the mobility and for each of these k points, the important q points for the lifetimes. We compute the lifetimes and we integrate that to directly get the, the mobility. This is what it gives for silicon, for the electrons in silicon. So we have the mobility as a function of the k point grid uh, that we use for the integration uh, for the mobility. For example, let's take this point, the 45, 45, 45. This is a q point mesh twice as dense. So that means that for this point, I use a 19, 19, 90 q point mesh. All right. So if we were computing all of the k-points, we would have for this point 2300 k-points for which we would need to compute the lifetimes and so on. But if we really filter the k-points and use compute the lifetimes only for the k-points that bring a contribution to the mobility, then this number is reducing down to 28. So we have a factor of almost 100 in the computational time because we just have to, 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 to account for a bit more than 1% of the k-points in the end. Now for the Q points, uh, well for this computation, all of them are uh, reach the same uh, conclusion. Less than 4% of the Q points are actually necessary for the, the lifetimes. So that means that we have again a factor of 25 here. Um, we can also use the double grid technique to get the mobility. And you see that in the case of silicon, the double grid technique in green gives basically exactly the same result as, uh, as without. So for example, here, we use a 45, 45, 45 k-point grids, the same for the um, short range matrix elements and the long range matrix element because it's silicon. But for the, the energies, we use a 90, 90, 90 k-point grid. Uh, just to mention that the experimental data are there, so it's always good news when we are not so far from the experimental data. And just to give you an idea, this computation took nine minutes with uh, 24 CPUs, so this is quite optimized now. Now let's look at the uh, polar material, gallium phosphide. A lot of curves, I'm gonna explain them uh, now. The first one in, in, uh, in black is the case where we use the same K and Q grids. Uh, for example, here we use a 40, 40, 40 K points grid and Q point grid. Then we can densify the Q point grid and go in the, 
in, in, in the, the red curve and use for this point uh, an 80, 80, 80 coupon grid, still a 40, 40, 40 coupon grid for the mobility, but we increase the density for the coupons grid for the lifetimes. We can go even uh, to denser coupons grid, 120, 120, 120, 120. But these computations are quite heavy tasks because we start to, to include more and more coupons and it's starting to, to be big computations. So instead of doing that, what we can do is use the double grid technique. The first flavor of the double grid technique where we use the, the, the dense grid for the energies only makes it go uh, part of the way from the black to the red one. You see we have uh, something that is better, but still not super close to the, the, the actual double grid technique. And when we compute the long range part of the matrix elements on the dense grid, then we have the orange curve. And you see that in this case, it's really following the, the case where we have the full matrix elements on the dense grid. So this is good because that means that we can get the mobility in polar materials for a cheaper computational cost than what we thought we had to do. So this is the conclusion for the first part of the talk. First, uh, we can compute the lifetimes with Abinit. Uh, we can use the tetrahedron method uh, that gives us the correct behavior without having to introduce a broadening parameter. We have a faster convergence with respect to Q point because the tetrahedron helps to better capture the, um, the delta functions. We have also this double grid technique, a dense grid for the energies or for the long range part of the matrix elements as well in polar materials. And finally, we compute the phonon limited mobility by computing only what is necessary and not extra stuff. So the lifetimes only for a few percent of the K points and for the matrix elements, we consider only a few percent of the Q points that contribute. Now I'll give the floor to Henrik for the second part. I have to give you this. Okay. Um, so for the second part, I will mostly talk of some technical aspects of, of, uh, of this. Um, so the first thing that we need to focus on was as the electron form of self energy. And this has actually been implemented by uh, Matteo already um, be, when, when, uh, by the time I arrived here. Uh, <coughs> And uh, the idea to, to be able to, to evaluate this object, uh, well, one needs to get these matrix elements uh, for, for different bands and from different Q points. Uh, and instead of interpolating this object like it's done in Vanier uh, basis, one interpolates the DFPT potentials. Uh, there one has to be careful with um, removing the long range part and then adding it back after the, the interpolation. Um, <coughs> And uh, so this is similar to what is done on the dynamical matrix for phonons. Um, and another important aspect is uh, to store this object in memory. This is as the size of FFT. Um, so there are many different uh, things that, that we've been <coughs> implementing uh, to, to reduce the amount of memory. So for example, the box cut mean, so to reduce the size of the FFT grid, uh, use single precision for the potentials. Also, it's possible to use single precision to, um, to do the FFT. <coughs> and then, of course, distribute uh, these uh, Vs for, for the perturbations and for Q points here. Um, then we need to compute the wave functions. So this is just a standard non-self-consistent calculation. Um, and uh, once we have this, these two ingredients, we can compute this G uh, on the fly. So this is, we have these ingredients and the, these dot products, color products are, are computed inside the code on the fly. So no, no not, it's not written to, to file. Um, so just to give an idea of the, over, of the workflow, this would be uh, a workflow for a standard DFPT calculation. Uh, in the end, you, you, get, you do your uh, computation of the potentials and you get your DDB for plotting for non-dispersion. Now, uh, as extra to compute the self-energy, one has to get also the derivative of the potentials, uh, and then also get a, a wave function file from non-self-consistent calculation. And all these things are then combined in the EPH driver. This is all implemented in Abinit uh, to produce this uh, SIG EPH file that will contain uh, the self-energy object. Okay. Um, Okay, one important thing, well, one thing that we implemented is a restart feature in this because these computations can be a bit uh, time consuming. For each K point, you have to compute this, this object. Uh, 
So we implemented a restart feature. So we have just an extra array with done, not done. Um, and inside the loop, we, we tick if this, this uh, self-energy part was done. And if the calculation crashes due to all time or whatever, then we can restart it uh, by just adding this variable on the input file. This is kind of important for to save computational time. These, cal these calculations, in some cases, they, they still take some time. The silicon case is a good one, easy one. Um, the, then, okay, uh, we wanted to look at transport, so we're not, look, no, not particularly interested on the real part yet, or for this particular application. Uh, and in this case, we will focus on the imaginary part of this object. The imaginary part comes from these uh, two, part, two, two uh, small imaginary components here that should be made small, to, that in the limit one gets delta functions. Okay. Um, and these are the, well, we implemented the, these three techniques that uh, Guillaume already described and, and showed you the results. So one is the double grid, so that's to evaluate the eigenvalues on a denser grid than the, the matrix elements. And this can be done with, in two different ways. One is with a SKW interpolation that is just uh, the same that is implemented in Bootstrap. Uh, so, and it's quite fast to, to get more, uh, more eigenvalues in between. It's, it's Fourier uh, interpolation. Uh, it, it has some, in some cases, it's, uh, it has some artifacts, so one has to be careful. And f because of that, we allow also to, to, um, to do a form from a known self-consistent calculation. And here, only, we only need an eigenvalue, so one can use a very low uh, convergence uh, threshold for the wave functions. And then we use these uh, input variables to read uh, these files. Uh, then we have also uh, the tetra integration method, which I will describe in, in, in a short while. And, and the other th uh, aspect is the Q and K point filtering. And this, uh, well, Guillaume mentioned the uh, K point filtering, so that uh, when we want to compute mobility, only these points are interesting, so we should only compute those. But for, to compute each of these K points, one has to sum over Q. And uh, this sum over Q, uh, let me just show you the expression here again. Uh, to sum over Q, well, we are going to multiply a matrix element by these delta factors. Now, if we can compute these delta factors before and we know that they are zero, then we can avoid computing this guy. And we can save a lot of uh, memory with that and computational time. So the, this Q point filtering is actually relies a lot on, on this, on that we are describing correctly these uh, delta functions. Uh, if, we, on the other hand, instead of using a tetrahedron integration, we are using um, a smearing technique like Gaussian or Lorentzian, then our um, filtering will not be very effective. Okay. So, um, so for the tetrahedron integration, um, well, the idea is just that uh, on the limit of a small uh, gamma, that's uh, the var variable Z cut that, that governs this broadening. Um, in, in this case, we would have to converge the gamma and Q. And uh, in the case of tetrahedron, because we reproduce these uh, delta functions, we don't have uh, this Z cut to converge together with Q. So that simplifies a lot the conversion studies. Uh, also, it assumes an, a linear interpolation of the eigenvalues and matrix elements, which is uh, a big plus that helps uh, to converge faster. Uh, so, put short, the idea of, of tetrahedron method is to divide the Brillouin zone using tetrahedrons. And when we have integrals on the Brillouin zone like this, we can formulate them uh, in this way. Um, where we keep track of which k points are in each edge of the tetrahedra, and then we have simple analytical expressions for these uh, two things. Uh, and these are the matrix elements uh, that we, we've computed before. And there are a lot of references uh, um, describing this, this, this method. Um, the, the, what we found, well, there was already an implementation of tetrahedra in, in, in Abinit. Uh, but uh, we found some, uh, it, it was allocating too much memory because perhaps it was not designed to handle uh, such large uh, K and, and well, Q grids. Um, the, the, this old implementation was creating a list of all tetrahedra, then hashing, sorting, and reducing to unique tetrahedra because those are the ones that you need to accumulate. Uh, we 
modify this implementation a bit just to uh, store only the, the, the trades that are unique immediately. So doing dashing directly and only storing uh, the new ones. Uh, and with that we were able to reduce a lot uh, memory footprint, which well, then will allow us to use uh, more efficiently all, all the machines we have. Uh, ah, this trace here is uh, produced with um, ABIMEM level 3, which was um, with Matteo, Matteo introduced this one, and then one can use a Python script to, to make a plot of, of the memory usage uh, uh, as, a, well, as you run uh, the code. Okay, so this is it's quite useful to find where the big memory allocations are. Um, well, next, uh, we had to, to evaluate this expression for uh, transport. And uh, this, uh, this involves uh, velocity matrix elements. Before uh, this was done, well, in some cases, it was done running, passing through the DFPT. Um, and then uh, there has to be a DFPT run for each of the three directions, then uh, uh, wave function files. Uh, but this is a lot of I.O. And, and waste, if, in particular if we are interested only in the diagonal part. Uh, so an intermediate uh, better approach was to use the um, GW machinery, which allows to compute this thing uh, just from the, the wave functions. So we could re compute them on the fly and accumulate directly, and only for the diagonal matrix elements. Uh, but when we are doing off-diagonal, Perhaps this, this routine is not the most efficient one in the sense that uh, it applies this part to this one and then this one together within the same call. While uh, it's better to just apply this one to this and then accumulate to all the bands that we need here. This is for, uh, in general, for, for um, Kai or something. Uh, for our case, we are interested in, in the diagonal matrix elements only, so it's, it's easier. So this uh, has been done by wrapping the, some DFPT routines inside this DKK opt object that allows uh, to compute these matrix elements uh, on the fly just from the wave functions that are already in memory. Uh, and this object then uh, can be used for, for transport. That was our particular application, but also for interpolation or, or um, computation of uh, optical properties, for example. And this, is this same philosophy is actually the same that was used for the matrix for the electron foreign matrix elements. Um, then we want to evaluate this expression. Uh, we wanted to use that reader method, so we kind of have, had to split it into two parts. So a kernel that has the form that we can uh, use the tetrahedron reader integration method, and then this part is just a convolution a integration over frequency. Okay. Um, so this is all implemented inside Abinit. It starts from the CGPH file. Uh, it actually is run automatically when we run uh, when we make a run of CGPH just for the imaginary part, and we can compute conductivity, mobility, C back. There is a new NetCDF file uh, that contains all these transport quantities, and then we can analyze results with Abipy. Uh, just to give you okay, so the the transport workflow is now more complicated than the CGPH, of course. Because we have well, we have a new uh, intermediate step where we can select which bands will contribute. So when we do the non-self-consistent run, we can compute the wave functions only for the states that will be uh, important in our transport computation. Uh, then we can produce two files: one for the double grid, one for the, the normal grid. Let's say uh, we do still computation with CGPH. And then we have a uh, final post-processing transport that is all implemented in, in, inside Abinit. Uh, then we implemented also some unit tests. We found that, for example, to test these that rhythm routines was better to have a part outside of the main code to test. Uh, we find also some that these routines uh, mapping K points are uh, slow for this size of grids that we are using. Uh, well, this is a work in progress, these unit tests, but we start to implement some, some, some tests of, of uh, routines there. Um, so, well, okay, we, along the way, all these changes and implement, implementation, we, we learned some, some things. Well, we should try to avoid I.O. We should try to recompute stuff. We should try to use, for example, uh, good integration methods when the objective is to integrate on the Berlin zone, try to use tetrahedron save memory, and uh, well, checkpoint uh, calculation is also good to have. 
Uh, well, further work, there are still well, some particularities to be uh, handled here. Um, then perhaps we can uh, work with uh, an improved tetrahedron method. And we need to work also on these routines to make them scalable to the size of Q points that, that we are trying to, to use. And uh, so, well, this is the acknowledgments. Uh, I'm missing Guillaume here, but he's there. <laughs> and Matteo, of course, that is sitting there, that has been working together with us on all this stuff and, and is, is uh, hard, hard colder. <laughs> and to the supervisor, of course. Okay, so thank you. <laughs>